Hi everybody, thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, this is my second time hosting um, one of these fantastic forums. Uh, thank you to uh, Bridgepoint. Um, my name is Edward Lowe, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Motor Trend. Um, I'm super, super excited to be here, see a lot of friendly faces in the audience. Um, thanks again for joining us. We're doing a forum today, a panel discussion on 30 years of Japanese luxury. I have a fantastic panel. Uh, very, very uh, insightful um, executives, designers from the auto industry, some very famous people, some people that have been big movers and shakers throughout the 30 years of Japanese uh, luxury cars. And uh, I just want to get into it and give you some announcements, uh, some introductions very quickly in uh, alphabetical order. Um, Alfonso Albaisa is the uh, Senior Vice President, Global Design for Nissan Motor Company. So Alfonso, thank you for being here. Next we have David Christ. He's the uh, Group Vice President and General Manager for Lexus. Um, thank, you. thank you. And then uh, John Ikeda, uh, the VP and uh, Brand Officer, Acura Brand Officer for Acura. Yeah. Also has a deep design background. Uh, and then there's, uh, next to me is uh, the legendary uh, Tom Matano. Clap first, Tom. You're, whether you know it or not, you're all very familiar with his, uh, his work. He's uh, been around a lot of different car companies, uh, General Motors, Holden out of Australia, uh, BMW, uh, Mazda for a very long time. Uh, he was a chief designer, executive designer there. Uh, currently is a, a, an instructor in industrial design at the Academy of Art in San Francisco. So Tom, thank you again for being here. He's the, uh, one of the guys who uh, was on my panel last year, so I'm very blessed to have him back <laughs> again. Um, lastly, uh, Angus McKenzie, our International Bureau Chief for Motor Trend, also one of my mentors. He's been in the game a lot longer than I have, has a lot of insights uh, about cars in general, but also knows a thing or two about Japanese luxury, so um, glad to have him here as well, so thank you. <laughs> All right. We're going to just dive right into it because we have a very short amount of time and we're going to go uh, really deep, uh, really quickly, and uh, we have to be out of here by about 3.58 is my understanding. So um, we're going to go right into it. You know, Acura was founded in 1986, uh, Lexus and Infiniti in uh, 1989. I believe Infiniti made its announcement at the North American Auto Show. It was not the North American International Auto Show. It was the show in Detroit that used to be called the Detroit Show. Uh, announcement in that January that they, Infinity was coming into being. And then later in the year, Lexus made the announcement as well that, uh, uh, or sorry, Toyota made the announcement that Lexus would be launched as a luxury brand. Um, so we're celebrating 30 years, 30 plus years um, of the story of Japanese luxury in America. And um, I just wanted to, to, to kick it off by asking each panelist, without, you know, you don't have to date yourself unless you, you want to, but where were you for the, for the start of Japanese luxury? Where were you in like the mid 80s, um, the mid to late 80s? I can tell you I was, I think like seventh grade, and uh, I, was, I was pinning all the pictures on the walls. Sorry, sorry, you know. But I, I was a huge fan. I had put you know, a lot of your products onto my walls as a kid. But where were you guys at the start of Japanese luxury? Tom, how about you go first? Well, um, you know, this is the 30th, 30th year for the Miata as well. So I was in uh, Mazda studio in California and designing those cars at the time. And I'm a lot younger than today. Got it, got it. I didn't have a gray hair then, I think. <laughs> All right, John? Uh, for me, I was uh, second year at Art Center College of Design, basically. And uh, just getting blown away with all the crazy power that Japan Inc. was bringing at the time with uh, all, the, all the products okay. as a student. Yep. So for those of you who don't know, um, Art Center in Pasadena is one of the foremost uh, schools of design for automotive, for industrial design. Um, great, thank you. David? Dad, you're not going to like this. I was in high school. Yes. 
but I was closely monitoring the launch because I worked at a Toyota dealership. Oh, so right. I was pretty close to it. Which, which Toyota dealership? Uh, it's called Liberty Toyota in Burlington, New Jersey. Awesome. Very cool, very cool. Toyota guy from the, from the very start. From the, ver from the start. Alfonso? I was in the back row in Detroit. I was actually, I just joined the company. Okay. And uh, I was a kid, I was probably 23 years old. I had, was working already in the California studio and uh, got into the, the press day. I was in the back row. And I joined the company because I love Nissan and, and Datsun before that. And then to start in the company and then realize that you're also doing luxury V8 is completely different. The Q45 was the car that we would end up working on. Um, it's spectacular, actually. And I know, well, I think I know what Angus is going to say, but Angus, where, where were you back, back in uh, that, that area? I was in Australia actually testing these cars. I was, um, started my career at a magazine, long defunct, called Motor Manual, uh, but ended up in Wheels Magazine in Australia in uh, the, the late 80s, early 90s. So when the Japanese luxury explosion happened, I was there driving the cars. Great. So we know where you guys were sort of physically in, in the time-space realm, but uh, you know, as a follow-up, um, where did Japanese luxury, uh, Japanese luxury cars, where did that segment actually begin for you? Like what, is there a moment, is there, is there a vehicle, is there, what defines it for you? Um, what would you say is like, that's it, that's where it starts for me? And I'm just gonna randomly go to, to John with this one. Okay, well, as a student looking, you know, with ACU coming on, it was, the NSX was just insane. They announced all that. And uh, from my perspective, it wasn't so much with that vehicle, uh, luxury per se, but just, it was just an insane performance uh, statement with the all woman body and everything. It was just, uh, I think it, it put a stamp of what, you know, Japan Inc. was going to bring to the table here as, as it was moving along. But from a luxury perspective, I, I would definitely say it was humbling to have Lexus come on. I was in R&D and design, and uh, when the LS400 came on, it was a, it was a whole different ball game and, uh, in terms of quality build and things like that. So uh, they definitely put uh, a new perspective on that also. But I think those, those cars were really something that kind of, you know, performance and luxury. I also remember Infinity with, you know, the, the whole, noble attempt at, at Japanese is this. This is Japanese luxury. And I thought it was a, I think all three brands were trying to bring something to the table there, but it, it was just an incredible time for all of it going on, yeah. Um, David, how about you? So the, the launch of the LS400, you know, I, was, I knew I wanted to be in this industry and working at a Toyota dealership uh, and experiencing driving that product, it just, it, it was the refinement and the quality and the attention to detail was just like no other. Okay. How about you, Alfonso? Uh, it was my, uh, my second project at Nissan, uh, at Nissan Design International back then in Southern California. And it was the, the J30 was the project that we had. And it was very much, uh, even though we were very much in love with the Japanese uh, luxury and all of the, the, the cues from the Q45, but then when the car was going to be a little more personal and it had a little bit of a whiff of a jag actually in the back of that car, uh, I, I was working on that one and uh, loving it really. Okay. Tom? Well, I was at BMW prior and the reason I went to BMW was to learn one design will last 10 years or more. Yeah. And that's what I wanted to learn, and I learned it, the way, the methodology and everything, and came to Mazda, I wanted to practice something. Um, we didn't have a luxury brand at a time, but I practiced on RX-7 uh, to be a long-lasting design. And then a luxury brand came afterwards, even though we never made it to the market. That's a perfect segue for my next question. Um, look, we have the representatives here from Acura, Lexus, and Infinity. There is one brand, that, as you referenced, that was that spent a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of R&D, but it never came into being. Can you tell us a little bit about Amadi and, uh, and your involvement and what that was and, and why it, it just never happened? 
Well, um, first of all, I'm happy that didn't happen. <laughs> would, would have killed the monster a long time ago, so uh, for that reason. But uh, as a design, we did all three, you know, the, the, the lower entry level, the mid-class, and the top line uh, V12 uh, prototype as well. So we finished the design, pretty much. And only car came, well, the first one came out with a millennia that was the middle of the lineup. And then a Zeto 6 or Unos uh, 600, the little one that went to Europe and Japan. Uh, but I finally get to ex execute something about the luxury car, you know, that the attention to details and maturing the designing somewhat. Right. But it was, these were very bold propositions for a small car company, right? These were, uh, if I recall correctly, Miller cycle engines, yeah. so advanced, um, advanced engineering, but also really um, a lot of attention to detail in the design and the craftsmanship. And um, as, as you mentioned, it, it might have been a disaster had it gone through. Um, yeah, it was a financially a disaster, but uh, like a small V6, v, uh, V6 engines, and, yep. yeah. It's a gem of a car. Okay. So, if I can just pivot here just a little bit, um, we're here at the uh, you know Pebble Beach Concours weekend. There's a lot of different events going on. Uh, there's among the different things uh, to see and experience, especially if you're interested in these cars, is is the JAI, the Japanese Automotive Invitational that Motor Trend is putting on with our our friends at Infinity. Um, you can see a lot of the cars that we've been uh, already discussed, the Q45, the LS400. Uh, you can see the J30. There's a J30 up there. There's a bunch of concept cars. Um, it's up at the top of Peter Hay Hill. It's free. I'm giving tours. Some of my team is giving tours throughout the weekend. It's a fantastic event. I encourage you to check it out. There's also a number of auctions uh, going on this weekend, tonight, tomorrow night. They've been, they've been going on. And uh, on the subject of auctions, uh, I noted with great interest that uh, Lexus LFAs now are really starting to appreciate in value. Um, Lexus might be, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, maybe the first of, the, of this new breed of luxury uh, mark that has a, a real collectible on its hand with the LFA, particularly the Nürburgring edition cars, which um, have gone, I think, in excess of a million dollars at auction. David, is, is, is Lexus, you're, I, I heard that you're like, you're the highest guy at Lexus. You, the, the buck stops with you. Um, is Lexus paying attention? Is this on their radar? Are they, are they following, tracking LFAs? And yeah, we're very proud of the LFA. Uh, we're proud when we built it. Uh, we're proud when we sold it. I think the auction value is just a function of, uh, the car's only eight years old. You know, when you think about the history and the depth of history of supercars here, uh, that's really new. And um, the auction values are just a function of people beginning to appreciate the quality of that product. And um, we think that they're going to continue to rise over time. We only built 500 globally. And uh, the car has done nothing but impress its owners. And we stay very close to them. And we think they're, you know, the future's bright. Um, slight counterpoint, Angus. Uh, We've talked about this quite a lot. Um, you have told me on several occasions that, you know, one of the, the seminal moments for you was the, uh, the 1989 Tokyo Motor Show. Uh, why? Well, it was. If you wanted to see the awakening of the sleeping giant that was the Japanese automotive industry, it happened, the Tokyo Show, 1989. I saw more. The LS400 was there, the NSX was there, they'd already been launched, but Toyota had things like the 4500 GT, which was a Porsche 928 wannabe as a concept car, fully running uh, prototype. It had the Serra, the Gullwing car. Subaru had the SVX, the six-cylinder car with the concept car little windows in it and the bubble top. Um, Isuzu had a supercar, the 4200R. Um, Nissan, I think, was showing another iteration of the mid-four, all-wheel drive, uh, four-wheel steering supercar. And as a journalist, I walked out of that show with some of my colleagues, and we were going, this is it. Japan, the Japanese auto industry, are now masters of the universe. There isn't a single segment, automotive segment, 
that they're now not competitive in. I mean, the NSX is the reason Ferraris are so good today, because of the Ferrari at the time, the 348, was a terrible, terrible car. Horrible. The LS400 is the reason the W140 Mercedes-Benz S-Class arrived late and over budget and cost the head of R&D at Mercedes-Benz his job. So those two cars, yes, they were the headline cars, but everywhere else you looked in Tokyo, Japan had something that made you just stop and stare and shake your head. How can they do this? Thank you. Um, Tom, would you, uh, would you agree, disagree? Any, any uh, counterpoint there? Any, uh... No, that, that was, uh, you know, they've been chasing the top of the world, and then finally that point, they, they sort of matched it. Right. Um, but in the meantime, they lost the direction as well, so. In what way? Well, you know, it's really good to chase the direction, but once you get up there, you have to have your own vision or something to get up to. Okay. So for a while, they lost it for a while. Now looking at cards today, each one of them got a vision and their brand established. So they are going forward with more uh, same sort of aggression as before. Okay. Well, you raise, uh, both of you raise a, a pretty interesting point. And I do, I'm not, one, I'm not picking on you, John. Uh, but, you know, Acura was first, you know, to the segment in 86. Um, came out with uh, the legend... Uh, Integra, which I love. The names, like Acura itself, what a great name. Integra, right? Integrity, Legend. I mean, you can, these are just fantastic names. The cars were, were excellent. Followed up with the NSX. And then, you know, some might say there was a, a, a period of unevenness where maybe things were kind of lost a little bit. Um, you guys had a great debut yesterday of the new uh, Type S concept. Uh, you all also currently the leader in the segment with uh, RDX. It's like the best-selling, I think, luxury model. It's uh, top three, uh, I think, in volume, like overall. Um, how do you, where is, where is Acura now? What, what, what keeps it going forward? Like, yeah. Explain yourself. <clears throat> well, I mean, you know, we're 30 years old, pretty much, all, all three of us here. And, um, what we talk about with Acura anyways is, you know, we came out of the blocks. We did what we knew at Honda, which was performance. That's what we were. We had, those were the heydays when Senna was running around with Formula One and Prost and McLaren. All that stuff was going on. So racing was obviously in our blood, and uh, that's what all the designers and most of the engineers were focused on. And it's something that continues to be there. But I'm going to tell you, the Lexus guys came in. And uh, they took it to a whole nother level. Uh, the luxury word started to creep into our vocabulary a little bit. And uh, we started to look at things. And we started to question, what are we doing? Is this right? Uh, should we do this or that? Instead of, we were, we were performance. That's what we wanted to do. And so we constantly talked about in the beginning, like lightweight, aluminum body. We had a show car called the FSX in the early 90s that I worked on. It was the first show car I worked on all in body, you know, that was going to be, we should go this direction and all wheel drive and all of these things were happening. But yeah, it's, uh, you know, uh, it's growing pains, right? You come out of the blocks and you're making a lot of noise and in your 20s, you think you know what you're doing, but there's pictures of me in my 20s I'm not so proud of, you know, <laughs> we talk about that all the time. No social media, so there's no record of it, but I had, I had crazy hair as a designer, right? And we had some crazy clothes, but at 30, we know we are a little bit. Uh, we refocus ourselves on performance. And so you're starting to see precision crafted performance come back on the map. We relaunched the NSX, we're racing, we got Type S on the table. That's what we're focused on now, and I think that's what we're going to stick and go okay. with. Yeah. All right. Well, you mentioned um, crazy hair and maybe some crazy designs. Um, Alfonso, at the, uh, at the JI, there is a, a vehicle out there. Um, very, very much ahead of its time. It's one actually I saw uh, when I first entered into automotive publishing in the early 2000s. I, I was invited by a friend of mine who was at a PR agency and said, hey, you got to come to this dinner. We want to show you pictures of this new concept car uh, that's coming out from Infinity. And I said, you want me to come to a dinner to look at pictures of a car? Is the dinner free? And uh, he said, yes. He said, all right. 
So I'll be there. And he showed the picture of this, this very long, this very sort of sleek a vehicle. And they said it, had, uh, it was inspired by something called the bionic cheetah. And uh, eventually, this became the uh, FX45, which um, if you're a student of, I think, uh, automotive and you've seen some of the cars that have come to market, you realize was was way ahead of its time. I mean, this is a, essentially a crossover, a high performance crossover SUV, huge V8 engine, crazy power. What was going on with that? And how did how did Infinity so could they be so bold, but I think almost mistimed the market? Because now you see those kind of cars all over the place. Oh, or am I wrong? My first glance at it was, uh, you know, you have to realize the context of the company. I like to build on what Tom said a little bit. 89 was the height of Tokyo Motor Show, sorry, uh, Tokyo Motor Show showed Japan, Japan Inc. really, and the dominance of um, Japanese car design and the future message. And there was a collapse. And especially for us, our collapse was heroic. Ours was like an inverted cyclone. And uh, we rode it all the way to 1989. I mean, 99, right before the alliance. And out of the complete devastation of our company, including planning, uh, FX, and uh, a few cars came. FX, the G Coupe, the G Sedan, the Murano, the Z, all of these came from the ashes. And the FX is uh, a little bit similar. I saw a picture also, because in the old days, you get the a FedEx package from Japan. And as global directors, we had to vote or go with one. And I, and I saw the first photo. It's a crossover SUV. It looks nice. Second one, looks nice. And the third one was this little egg with a, that swallowed an aircraft carrier. It looked like completely disconnected from life yeah. as we know it. If you did a benchmarking of crossovers, which only BMW X5 and Bronco existed and Lexus had just come out, um, it was completely alien, and, uh, and then the company was in the mood to make a statement to say that Nissan Motors, and especially Infiniti, that we were going to strike our, our bold path um, independent of the world. So uh, that's, it allowed the company to make such a bold decision, like uh, an invention like the FX. So we were very proud of that car. I guess what what were your what were your impressions when you uh, when you first drove that? Do you do you remember? Do you recall the launch? Oh, absolutely! It was it it was a thing all of its all of its own. There was nothing else like it. And ironically, now when you look at where everybody's going, it's arguably and there's a huge debate about this. One of these four door coupe SUVs. It was probably the first. And and yeah, it it it's amazing that it never really took off. It maybe just was ahead of its time. But I remember it being absolutely blown away by driving that thing. And look, I, you know, I, I'm not going to call anybody out, but you know, I, when I look at a Maserati Levante, I don't know how you can't just look back at the FX45 and say, what were, you know, this is like the exact same thing just, you know, 15 years later. So let's, let's go around, around the panel again. Um, what we've, we've heard, I've mentioned a few cars, uh, LS, FX, uh, Amati, the whole, the whole lineup. Um, NSX, what impact have, have these vehicles had, do you think, on the broader, on the broader automotive space, on, on maybe the Germans or uh, American luxury, per se? Um, I saw Tom kind of take a deep breath yeah. here. You know, when those cars came out and I was watching what the Germans' reaction would be and what they had against the Japanese or above and over was a history and uh, racing background. And within six months, Mercedes starts showing their histories and their racing background. So they are threatened much sooner than I thought. That was my yardstick, you know, how they're gonna react to, but a lot sooner than I thought. Because that was the only thing they had against them to, to fight with, and they used it right away in the six months. I was just uh, starting out as a designer, and uh, I will say this much, I mean, I remember interning at a domestic brand and uh, they talked about the NSX, you know, and reverse engineering it. And 
doing all kinds of things, and the result being we can't do this. And, and at that time, I wanted to work there, but obviously I changed my mind because I wanted to go where people could do crazy things like the NSX. And so, you know, it had, I think it had overall impact, and it was very, if you were into vehicles, you kind of see what was happening there with these cars that we're talking about right now. I think it, it made a difference that, hey, there's other options. And, uh, and I think, uh, yeah, those cards at that time were really, really impactful. Yep. You know, I think that the advent of Japanese luxury really helped the consumer the most. Because if you think about it, then there were only a few volume luxury brands. You know, there was Cadillac, there was Mercedes, there was BMW, maybe to a lesser degree Lincoln. Audi didn't really have a presence yet. Um, Jaguar Land Rover didn't have a presence. So here comes three established companies with a reputation for really solid products. Now your competition basically almost doubles, right? So every brand had to elevate their game, higher quality, higher customer service. And I think the winner in all of it was the consumer because it made everybody raise, their, raise the table stakes. Right. And, uh, and that lasted since. Right. To follow up on that, um, how much of Lexus's success would you attribute to its products versus, and I've heard this, I, you know, I, I don't get a lot of this firsthand experience, but the other side that you mentioned, the customer service element, the dealership experience, how, how much would you say it's equal, even? Is it one, bit, one more than the other? Yeah, it's a great question. We, we really try to do two things at Lexus. One is build a great product, and the second is deliver a great experience. And when you think about our tagline, experience amazing, we really look at it twofold. One is the product, and one is the amazing dealer and driving experience. And uh, I think we put a lot of time and energy and focus into both. And when you think about that origin, there's of course the LS400, which was a seminal product, but there also, I remember reading a quote uh, from J.D. Power that said, the brand really began when we had our first recall. And when we had our first recall, we really took the customer experience and the customer service to a whole new level. And those two combined kind of began the foundation of our brand, the product and the guest experience. One of the most beautiful aspects of Japan is this sense of omotenashi, this sense of hospitality. It's not just being nice. It's to honestly and deeply care about the needs and desires of, of others other than yourself. And I do believe that uh, that's one of the reasons the Japanese luxury cars did so well, is that especially in the beginning, uh, when Lexus and Infiniti first launched, uh, the dealership experience was unlike BMW, Mercedes, and any of these other very good, uh, credible luxury brands. And it had to do, I think, with this uh, Japanese sens sensibility. And, uh, and I think, and I think it's credit to Lexus, uh, we don't acknowledge enough that for a long time, Lexus was the number one luxury brand in the United States. Better than, more than Mercedes, BMW, and Audi. And that uh, we, we should embrace this sense that the customers love Japanese luxury. They prefer it. I think the Lexus is a little bit down against Mercedes lately, but um, not much. We're number one in retail. Just number one in retail. There you go. <laughs> just to clarify. I'll give you that. I'll give it We're all friends here, we're but just to clarify. <laughs> I'll give you that. But, um, and I do think that we're reflecting on this. And even in, in our own company, that uh, how much have we really embraced the fact that we're Japanese? Right. We're not an international company. We're a Japanese company that sells in every corner of the world. If you add up all the sales of Japanese, the little island, you add up all the cars that are related to that island, it represents 30% of all the cars in the world. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And uh, that's why I think the, your efforts to show all of these great cars of the history is important so that we can all talk about how damn great those Japanese cars are, those luxury cars. You know, um, we were going into that organic light and shade, highlight oriented design at the time in the beginning of the 90s. So I sent a memo to Mazda, the showroom 
or the auto show stand have a direct, indirect lighting, like a silk screening, right. for the studio to get the highlight looking beautiful. And I found that out, the Lexus dealership manual says the building, the showroom has to have an infinity corner on any lighting area to put the cars in. And they had indirect lighting, all the specifications being written. And I said, oh, wow, they did the homework. I mean, really, Lexus did the, the, that much detail. Angus, you have no skin in the game, so the question to you, the same, is, you know, but what impact did you observe uh, on the broader market from the products of, of these gentlemen? Well, initially, you had the obvious things, like improvements in uh, perceived quality. So, you know, panel gap lines went down because, you know, Lexus and, and uh, Infinity had the best panel gaps. Um, you know, stitching was straight and, and the, the leather was smooth on the interior. And, and you know, the, the refinement and the silence. But I think what's, what's been interesting has been then the longer term reaction. It spurred the European um, luxury makers to think about it. Or, firstly, uh, the Japanese luxury brands democratized luxury. They made it more accessible to more people. And the Europeans did react. And in fact, if you look at Mercedes-Benz today, look at the bandwidth on that brand in terms of the product offering that it has. When I started in this business, I think it had five or six model lines. Now it's got 40. And the other thing that it's done is got the Europeans to look at how do we do mass customization? So you, you, know, you can now order Porsches and Mercedes in you know, paint to order color schemes. And I think that's an area where I, now maybe the Japanese luxury brands might be on the back foot and they might have to get much more into this mass customization thing that the Europeans are now saying is the next step in uh, affordable luxury. Got it, got it. Okay, we've talked a lot of business. Um, we have a lot of fans here. Uh, before we get into some of their questions, uh, I do wanna uh, go around the panel again and just ask, you know, absent any, any other of the cars that we've mentioned so far, or if you wanna repeat them, that's fine. Is there a particular vehicle we have not talked about that you wanna bring up for its significance, good or bad? It was. It was a moonshot that failed, or it was the most amazing thing that nobody ever heard of. Um, what's, what's, what's one uh, vehicle that, uh, that you guys really, really find special? And um, you know, I think for me, I'll, I'll just kick it off. I think it's really interesting that both Infiniti and Lexus, uh, when, they, when they launched, a lot of hay was made about the flagship model, the LS400, the Q45. Uh, and we've sort of forgotten the ES250 um, and uh, the, who can, who, can name, who can name Infinity's M30, right? Which was based on the Leopard, I believe, in Japan. So those are ones that I think are, have, have started to be forgotten by history. Maybe there'll be a resurgence, but is there any, any vehicle? And I'm gonna, go to, I'm gonna go to John first. I can see he's thinking about it. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things for us at Acura that we have to get back is, you know, we, we had simple cars like the Integra. It was so easy to understand. Yep. And um, I grew up, I grew up a, a, a Volkswagen GTI guy, you know, and I had a Scirocco in school and the whole deal. But when my friends were starting to drive around with CRXs and Integras, you know, you start you just start noticing the engine sounds and everything else is a whole nother level. So um, that kind of just easy to understand, pure joy that cars had. I think cars are getting very overcomplicated now. And uh, I had a friend, I drove a Type R the other day. Those are, those are things that uh, uh, we have to remember because I think even kids now would enjoy, all right, and uh, understand it because it's very, very simple. And so. Cars like that, I think where a lot of us were part of that culture, and uh, I think it'd be fun to bring back, yeah. Okay. So John's is Integra. Um, Alfonso. So the, probably, because we're in a weird situation right now where we're completely reforming uh, the portfolio with an electrified uh, powertrain. So I'm in a little bit of a honeymoon, so it's hard to, I'm really excited about these things. Um, but when I look back, I think we missed an opportunity to really push for the essence show car, where it's probably because in our company culture, we have our company halos, a GTR, 
And it's a little bit different than the Lexus situation. And um, so at the end of the day, GTR got the money and the essence, which would have been a, a, just a car that would have been wonderful. I, I do feel some guilt that I, I didn't fight for that in our, in our past, because this kind of Japanese uh, emotional luxury, um, I, I still look at that car, which we keep, and I, I think okay. we should have. Uh, David? So there's a couple. We talked about the LS400, obviously, kind of started the brand. Um, w when you think about it, the RX300 was the first crossover luxury SUV. And what it did was it said to a consumer that you can have more utility, but have a car-like ride, not a truck-like ride. It was also Motor Trend's uh, SUV of the year, I believe. I believe it's uh, the first one. Don't forget yes. MDX. Yes. And MDX, yes. Let's yes. not yes. forget MDX, because yes. I'm no, out that, That's right. And MCX9. But, the, the, but to that point, the RX really, it was great for consumers, right? Because it gave them a better ride with more utility, but it was also great for the industry. Yeah. Because it, it spawned other products that are really mainstream products now. Uh, the LFA we talked about, obviously, that's out at the Quail. That was us throwing the gauntlet down and saying we can build a supercar. And then I'd say most recently, uh, the LC500 is a spectacular product. Uh, we actually have the chief engineer here of the LC500. He's now the EVP of Lexus International, Koji Sato. Uh, Sato-san has d delivered an amazing product. It's a wonderful touring coupe. And if you have a chance at the Peter Hay Hill and can go into our display, we have an LC convertible concept. And the LC in the, and next the convertible is really I think what the future of Lexus is going to be, design direction, performance, quality, and uh, it's just a spectacular product. And, and the three cars, the, the RX and the LS were kind of our origins. The LFA and the LC are really our future. All great cars. I am surprised you didn't say the original SC uh, Coupe, which yes. classic design out of Kelty. I think a lot of people recognize that vehicle as a, as a seminal vehicle within uh, the, the history of not just Japanese luxury, but the Japanese sort of car industry. Uh, a lot of great stories about what that car did to its competitors and sort of making their heads spin. Um, Tom. <laughs> well, the, um, we didn't do a luxury car, but the one could have been was a three-rotor Cosmo Coupe. Right. Um, we designed it in, uh, we took over the final three weeks of the design to fix it. And uh, that quality of design could have been a luxury car uh, if we went ahead with it. Um, as for the future, the Lexus LS, uh, LC was it? Uh, yeah. Very intricate headlamps and unbelievable interior. And I think for mass production to do that is the new height that everybody has to chase for. Right. So that's like a Japanese craftsmanship. Angus? I think, uh, I think what's interesting is that the signs were there from a very early um, period, if you knew where to look, that J Japan was going to do this. I mean, you go back to the 60s, cars like the Toyota 2000 GT, or even the old Toyota Centuries, which never were sold outside Japan, but were hand-built luxury limousines. Then had design, some really nice design cars, like the Nissan Silvia from 1967. Nice uh, uh, piece of design there, and of course the the Prince Skyline cars, which were like Japan's BMWs of the 60s. And um, the, the signs for me were always there with cars like that, that Japan was always going to, to get there. You know, and Honda had even the very first little Honda S800 with a roller bearing crankshaft, like unbelievable engineering. You, you just knew that this was a sleeping giant. Even in the 60s, the signs were there. We are right on time. And we're going to get into some uh, questions from you guys in just a second. So I please want you to start thinking about them. Uh, but I want to do one last quick lightning round. Um, OK, so the whole reason I'm here, the whole reason we're here is because of the JAI, the Japanese Automotive Invitational. The point of that show was to bring in a new audience, a new type of um, enthusiast to Pebble Beach, to the Monterey Car Week, whatever you want to call it. Somebody who's maybe getting into the in, into this, really excited about cars, but you know, you know, air-cooled Porsches or 
through the roof, and alpha GTVs are also incredibly expensive. Getting in at a, at a more accessible point, a more relatable point, uh, you know, with cars that maybe were meaningful um, to you when you were growing up, bringing hopefully a younger audience or the young at heart, and really getting people in that collector's mindset. So the question to the group, and it doesn't have to be a Japanese luxury car, but which car would you say, hey, go buy one right now because these are only going up in value? And I'll start, because I heard it from one of my colleagues, I didn't realize this, but NA Miatas, the first gen Miatas, are starting to really go through the roof. Good job, Tom. Um, people are really interested in them in, in, uh, in spec racing, uh, but also because, because of the racing side, uh, there's not many that are still cherry. Like, people start to tear these things apart. So I've heard that a couple years ago, you can get a nice NA uh, Miata for about $5,000. Now good luck getting one for under 10. Uh, Tom, what's one that you would say, go out and buy one right now? <laughs> RX-7. RX-7. FD. F FD or FC? FD. FD RX-7. You heard it here. FD RX-7. Great. Me. John? I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an integral, passionate guy, but okay. I mean, it's already started to go crazy yep. with that car. Um, yeah, it's insane now. We have a lot of guys at the company that have it. Now everybody's like, that's their pension, right? They're not handing them Does off. Does it have to be a but, Type R? Could it be a GSR? Could be a GSR. Okay. GSR could definitely do it. Those engines are incredible, and uh, they're just fun to drive. A particular so I color? Those... I favor championship white? Yes. I would go with white. Not okay, there. good. Yep. David? So ISF, uh, you want to talk about affordable yes. luxury? Yes. It is a home run. Um, it's still reasonable in the, in the collector market. Yes. We're still selling it, but GSF? Okay. Home run product, really great performance, you know, uh, middle of the road pricing. ISF, the one I drove back when it launched had silver carbon fiber. That was, that was wild. <laughs> okay, Alfonso? Similar era as Tom's suggestion, but I would encourage you to also look at the two row twin turbo 300Z. Great, great. Two row twin turbo 300Z, yep. And Angus, what do you think? I'm going to go way off the reservation because there's a car that's close to my heart, a Datsun 510. But if you can yeah. find a triple S. Triple S. Okay. Great, great, great. All right. Uh, I don't know if we have a microphone to pass around. We have two mics. Great. So we have time. We have exactly 10 minutes for questions. Gentleman over here in the orange shirt. Let's go with you first. Okay. We've talked about um, the effect of the Japanese cars on the German cars. How about the Genesis and the effect Ooh. that Chinese, uh, Japanese cars have gone on Genesis and Genesis affecting the Japanese cars? Oh, great question, and I can actually take, uh, take that first. A cool story uh, that actually Angus was there for. This was um, Detroit last year, or? Yeah, Detroit, we were sitting around having dinner with another designer who I won't name, and uh, it was his birthday party, and we're hanging out, and Angus has a very distinct voice. I don't know if you can tell. It's this, this accent that he has. And um, some guy leans over and says, hey, um, hey are, you, uh, are you Angus McKenzie? He's like, yes. And they had this conversation. Turns out this guy is a designer for another uh, car brand. And so we started having this conversation. And he and I um, ask him, it's a big car company, by the way, huge. Uh, so you're a student of the, of the industry. Who is really knocking it out of the park for you? And this is an interior designer, an uh, interior car designer. He's like, oh, well, you know, Audi's doing really well. Mercedes-Benz uh, S-Class, uh, fantastic interior. And I said, okay, well, if you pick one, like, who is just straight up killing it? He's like, honestly, those Genesis guys are just absolutely nailing it. And uh, he was like, they're, they're really ones to watch. It's not just the stuff you see. Uh, it's the stuff you don't see. It's where you put your hand when you're touching the, like, the seat adjustment or adjusting something below, and you never run across, like, a sharp edge or a piece of metal or something that wasn't meant to be there. So that's something I heard. Um, guys, Genesis, what do you think? <laughs> Silence. Silence. I mean, from a, with Acura, okay, so 26 years in design. Last four years for me, general manager sales at Acura, right? And uh, that's a tough business. It's a tough business. And, uh, and from a sales perspective, to drive that wedge is a luxury brand now and this market is not so easy. But uh, obviously they're working really hard to do what they need to do. And um, it's, 
you know, the, the whole thing. I would, you know, we talked about this. I, I had a friend uh, that was going into work with Genesis and said, what would you, what advice, you know, you're an actor, you've been there. And I said, be yourself. Because uh, I'll, I'll tell you, we did some wandering around, looking at all kinds of what everybody else is doing. It didn't work out with, for us too good. I think uh, refocusing on what we're doing now is a lot better. So yeah, whatever that is that's driving them to do these types of design, it's, uh, I think it's very important for them that you really, really take care of that. Yeah. Okay. I think because they're a challenger. They're, they're new and they're challenging. Um, I'm always impressed by the amount of content that they're bringing into uh, a price point that is that the, maybe the rest of us probably are struggling would struggle to maintain the, the positions that we want. So I, I am impressed by that, and the, the level of design is it is quite high. Okay. So it, it only makes all of us better. The same as you, your question is this: this ping pong back and forth between us and the Germans is actually it's becoming a 3D ping pong and. You mentioned Chinese, this is coming. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're playing ping pong with both arms and between the legs and over the back <laughs> uh, because now the, the competition is getting, is intense and, and wonderful. Really. Yeah. And I think, I think we're going to see a redefinition of, we've talked about luxury, but I think the definition of luxury has changed over the past 30 years and has moved on to something else. So. You know, if you, at one level, premium is the new mainstream. So you look at certain segments of vehicles um, where, you know, the mainstream brands like Ford and so on used to play, they simply don't have vehicles there anymore because they're all premium or luxury vehicles. So what is luxury now? And I think that's something Genesis has to figure out. Great. Second question over here. Yes. First of all, thank you very much. Very interesting. Uh, various speakers have talked about uh, uh, what happened, especially in the late 80s and onwards. My question is, uh, why? Uh, what, was, what was the goal, probably in the mid-80s or early 80s? What was the corporate driver or the, the goal of these companies to, to, to flush out their line, to, to get revenue, to uh, just what was driving it, and how, how important was the US market in that, in that goal? It's a great question. Um, I, I know only a little bit of the history, and I, I think I hope David can help me with this, but I understand that the, the launch of, if you look at it as Lexus as being the one that kind of uh, kicked it off in, with the most, the deepest impact, Toyota had, that was a 10 year study, I believe, right? Like a, maybe it was like a billion dollar they spent, they were buying homes in luxurious neighborhoods and like spying on people in the name, maybe not exactly that, but looking at what people were driving and how they were interacting with their cars and what they were, what they were doing. And it was a massive investment. They launched their own ad agency through uh, Saatchi, I believe, that was just devoted to crafting this brand. And they went through the whole naming convention. It was actually supposed to be at one point Luxus, right? It wasn't, it wasn't L-E-X, it was I think L-U-X-U-S. And um, you know, I think if you look at automotive, the automotive industry, it's always been, um, kind of the, the strategy led by, by General Motors where it was a good, better, best, and Toyota for a long time had good and really good, and they said, well, if we can build these, why can't we build the next level? And then after that, bring in a level below, which, which ended up being Scion for a while. Um, that's my sort of quick overview. I don't, did I get it right, David? Yeah, I, you know, I think there were two primary drivers. The first was, um, at that time, the Toyota Cressida was the top and most expensive Toyota sold in the U.S. Customers were leaving that car, and we had, no, we had nothing to offer them. So it was that customer retention, keeping them in the family, in the brand. It was difficult to imagine building a more expensive Toyota than that. So the next logical step was luxury, and it was a segment we weren't in. Uh, the second is just sure, I'm sure there was a pure business and practical side of it is you know, more brands, more volume is good. We can lower fixed costs, et cetera. But the customers defecting, I think, was the primary driver. Very, very concerning at that time. That's great. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, um, the audio area techniques, the Panasonic is a common brand, and then they went to the high-end brand is techniques right. for Panasonic, uh, Matsushita and then other one. So they felt that changing the name could bring the brand value higher for the you know, more 
profit margin. Not, not and, just, yeah. Yeah, and a name like Toyota, Mazda, Nissan have a $30,000 limit that they could go to, like hate the searing in a people's mind. Right. So. Which is also why they did completely separate dealerships and, and made that part of the, the business model because, you know, just, just don't even tell people that these are related. Like, why, well, you don't need to. So don't confuse them. I think, the, I think the reliance on research is a very interesting point, too, because it's almost as if the Japanese automakers were observing a foreign species and trying to understand how it worked. And it, it led to one of, the, one of the flaws with the Japanese approach to luxury. And I remember when the LS400, the second generation car, came out. And I said, well, why don't you have an LS600 and an LS300? In other words, a six-cylinder car and a 12-cylinder car like Mercedes-Benz does. And there, the answer back to me was, well, we have researched the market, and a four-liter four V8 is what the market is, is most what the market most needs. And I said, well, this isn't the business not about what the market needs, but what the market wants. There might be people who want a six-cylinder engine. There are certainly people who would want a 12-cylinder engine. So there wasn't quite the intuitive feel for luxury at the beginning. It was very much a, a synthesized process. If I, can, if I can add to that, in, in, in our company, because um, for us, even though Infinity is 30 years old, but actually Infinity is Prince. Right. Uh, the, the rear wheel drive platform, the engineers, all of those folks that worked for that performance luxury Japanese company were brought into the mothership when we, uh, when we bought Prince. And so it was always natural. It's just like Tom mentioned. We were just, we were lucky that it was a time when Japan was in the surge of its economic growth and the opportunity came and that we can finally bring our luxury uh, dreams to the, the marketplace. But we have had them for a very, very long time, since the 60s. And uh, the Cedric and the Gloria in Japan are from Prince, actually. And the Skyline, the, which is a Q50, is a, is a very old name in the company. Um, and so we've had them always in there. So it was great that that happened. I think we have time for one more question, and we have a gentleman over here with a mic. Thank you. Um, so while not considered a luxury brand, the 240Z came out at a time when American models were changing every year. I'm curious about the current design influence that it might have had using a standard body style for about nine years, and if there was lessons learned from having a design that did carry forward for that extended period of time. Probably Alfonso, are you? Definitely. We are under, all of us are under great pressure. The, the customer themselves are becoming a bit antsy. And because as uh, transactions are more and more lease, uh, no one wants to lease the same car twice, there is this pressure. The, the days of a nine year model life is, is probably behind us, and, except maybe some rare ultra luxury car <laughs> trucks. Um, but we adapt. I mean, it's a, as a designer, we're, we're always, you know, we're, we're trying to streamline our process to be able to bring cars to a five-year type of life cycle. But um, it, I, I think that is a bit gone. With the, even the 240, we, we don't remember the fact that it got very tired at the end. It probably should have had a little bit less of a life cycle. All right. Well. We are right on time. We have to be out hard stop at four. So I do want to thank you all for joining us. Um, thank you to the panelists. You guys were awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and again, if you want to see a lot of the cars we talked about and talk to some of us, we'll be out there. It's the top of Peter Hay Hill. It's the Japanese Automotive Invitational presented by our partners, Infinity and Motor Trend. Please come up and say hello. Love to chat with you guys. Thank you again for joining us.